Nice. Um, if you're watching this video, you're probably in the right spot. The fact that you were able to access this and find this, whether it be through my Google Classroom or the NTI folders. Um, this is how I kind of think that we're going to start running class. I'm just going to video the lessons instead of um, just assigning you guys work because I want to I want to teach you instead of assign you work. Um, and I found it very difficult kind of talking to a iPad or just a bunch of empty desks. So instead, I, I kind of brought some of you guys along. So second period, you're with me here today. As you can see, those are all pictures of your all's wonderful faces staring right back at me. So anyway, so here we go. Here's our learning targets for the day. All right, so hopefully you can, by the, through this end of this lesson, and, I, and I'm trying to keep lessons less than 10 minutes um, and a few other videos, and I condense all those videos down to under two minutes. So um, you can fly right through this. So our targets today, we can understand the different types of stress and how it may affect the body, and then we're going to get into the circulatory system, the parts, functions, and ways to make us healthy. Um, right now, it's a stressful time for everybody in the nation and across the world as we're, we're dealing with this pandemic. So it's very appropriate that we're talking about stress and how it affects our body. So I'm going to move over here to, to my right, and we're going to be able to identify two types of stress, two types of stress, acute and chronic. So let me make sure that you're... I got the screen correct. There's acute and there's chronic. Okay, so acute stress. We're talking about short term, less than two weeks. And this can be beneficial to our body as it bolsters our immune system, helps us recover from surgery, enhances memory, as well as helps us cope with certain types of situations. So things that you're dealing with acute stress, maybe it be a homework assignment, or maybe it's uh, do a public speaking engagement, or maybe you're about ready to play in a big game. Um, those would be all acute stress. They're gonna come and go. Um, they're not gonna last very long. Um, th they don't stay with you. Those types of stress can be beneficial to our body. But the stress that we normally hear, and we naturally associate that's a bad for our body, is chronic stress. And that's stress that's gonna last typically longer than two weeks. Chronic typically means long, acute is short. Think about your geometry lesson. You've got your right angle and your acute angle. Your acute angle is small, okay? Less than 90 degrees. Um, but here we're talking about chronic, so it's prolonged periods. And this is going to be harmful to our bodies. And sure, we're gonna have some small things like headaches. Um, yeah, okay, we can deal with headaches. But now we get to more severe stuff. Blood pressure, that increases. Heart disease increases. Diabetes chances increases. Chance of depression, anxiety, those both go up. Um, so this is stuff that we have to take very serious. And oftentimes you might be going to, you might be thinking that you're stressed out all the time and your parents are probably thinking, what are they, what are they stressed out for? They're, they're high schoolers. Um, it's the best time of their life. Make sure that you understand this. The brain develops differently. And we're gonna talk about the brain in tomorrow's lesson. Um, but since your brain isn't fully developed, you guys handle stress a little bit different than somebody in their late 20s, 30s, or 40s. Um, so it is a stressful time for you all, but it's the way that your brain is constantly or, or currently um, processing that information and how your body reacts to it. So that's a short thumb notes or cliff notes version of, of stress. And we're gonna mainly kind of talk about the next part here, how stress can prevent, or excuse me, affect heart disease. And then we're gonna get into heart disease here um, in a little bit more detail. Like I said, sometimes this is difficult talking to a bunch of nobody right now, a bunch of empty desks. All right, so anyway, so let me move this over a little bit. We'll get to that part in a moment, but I'll tell you what, let's do it right now. Hopefully you were able to um, look at the diagram that I already put out there on Google Classroom and your NTI. Um, that's how we should have labeled it. So maybe we should, uh, we'll talk about that right now here. Let's get to this part here first and then we'll get back to that diagram okay heart is located in the middle of the chest about the size of your fist most of you guys know that from your elementary days um i, I know the, the the old process or the old thought was uh well if i'm doing the pledge of allegiance i got my hand over my heart and my heart's over here no please 
right here. If I, if I would happen to pass out in class and I need a CPR, please do not do CPR right over here on my left shoulder, okay? That's, even though we feel that a lot of times with, with the blood pumping that way and we put our hand over here on the Pledge of Allegiance, it's right here in the middle of our chest, okay? Now, blood and blood vessels, all right? Oftentimes you will go back here if we look a little bit back this way. All right, we oftentimes will see blue and red. Well, guys, that is just used for a teaching process, a teaching uh, understanding for elementary age kids. We do not have blue blood. Please don't let anybody tell you that we have blue blood because that is just flat out untrue. All right, but we do have something we call oxygenated and deoxygenated. Deoxygenated blood, the blood is darker, more of a maroon color, okay? And if it's oxygenated, it's typically bright red. So we'll get to this, I promise. Let's go back to here. Let's understand the functions here. All right, so we have different shades and I already talked about there in red. Brighter red, darker red. Make sure that you are putting these things in your notebook. Okay, if you need to pause the video, go get your notebook, please do so. All right, we have three types of, uh, of blood vessels. We got arteries, veins, and capillaries, and I list them from largest to smallest. Our largest arteries, it carries blood away from the heart, okay? It goes away. It's already entered the heart, and now it's, it's leaving to pump all that blood everywhere, we, wherever it needs to go. Remember, we have two things that give us oxygen. Or excuse me, two things that give us energy, and that's fuel and that's oxygen, okay? And we need both. And the oxygen keeps all cells alive. So we have to be able to get oxygen to all parts of our, our body, okay? So carries blood away from the heart. Has high oxygen levels. We don't need valves. We'll get to valves in a second, but we don't need valves because we have plenty of pressure. That's The blood's coming from the heart. Plenty of pressure coming out. It would be like a uh, um, blood coming out of a, uh, water coming out of a uh, fire hydrant. Tons of tons of pressure. We don't have to worry about the pressure. Okay, and, and these arteries are semi-elastic, and we're gonna talk about that later. Um, why even women, later on in life, after they, um, after they stop producing as much estrogen as they hit menopause, how sometimes their, their, their arteries are less elastic, and later on in life, women are a little bit more prone to heart disease. Um, but I, we'll get to that uh, on a different lesson. Then we got veins. Veins helps blood be carried away, excuse me, back to the heart, but it's, it does not have oxygen, okay? High oxygen with arteries, low oxygen, a little bit lower oxygen with veins. Again, A away, arteries away, all right? All right, difference between veins. Lower oxygen levels, it does have valves, just like a, um, a valve is you turning on the, the water from, on a sink or faucet or shower, turn on and off. It allows blood to constantly flow and to have a little bit of pressure build up into it. These are a little bit shallower. These arteries are a little bit deeper embedded un, into our, under our muscle and under our skin. It's deeper embedded. Veins are a little bit more shallower. Oftentimes we can see our veins through our arms and we pull up our sleeves. Um, we can see their veins. They're a little bit closer to the surface. And veins have a tendency to clot a little bit more. A lot of times you probably have heard about blood clots. Capillaries, not a big deal. Our face is filled with capillaries. It's very, very small, very, very thin. A lot of times right there on the surface of our body, if we'd happen to get hit in the face and have a little bit of a, a, a black eye or whatever the case is, lips, whatever, it's very vascular. So any type of facial injury have, has a tendency to bleed a little bit more. Um, but again, not all that big of a deal. Our eyes are filled with capillaries, our nose, our ears, all small, uh, small parts of our body, our eyelids. We can't have a big artery going through our eyelid. It, it's just not thick enough, it's not big enough. So it's filled with capillaries. And a lot of times capillaries will help connect arteries with veins, okay? All right, so let's get back to this heart diagram here. There we go. All right. So, as blood has been circulating through the body, it loses oxygen over that time, okay? Again, oxygen is a fuel source. So, it needs to make a quest to get back to acquire oxygen. That's the main goal of it, all right? 
So oxygen will come either through the superior or inferior vena cava, okay? Inf inferior and superior. If it's coming from my shoulders, my head, it's coming, out, coming down from the superior. If it's coming up from my legs, my hips, my lower back, my feet, anything, it's probably coming up from the inferior vena cava. All right, so it's making a quest to get to one of the four chambers. And we have four chambers in our heart. The top two are atriums, the bottom two are ventricles. Now you might be looking at this, at this diagram and you might be going, Mr. Code, this diagram is wrong. They got the word right listed on the left side and the word left listed on the right side. No, this diagram is not wrong. You have to understand you're looking at it from a doctor's point of view, but if you're looking at it from the patient's point of view and their, their switch, this is my left side, this is my right side. So left atrium, right atrium. All right, so the blood comes through the inferior and superior vena cava right into our right atrium, okay? Gets pumped down here into the right ventricle. Now, it's still low in oxygen, so it has to make a quest to go to find oxygen. And that's where it gets pumped to pulmonary veins and valves and, and, and arteries, okay? So again, we're going away, so we're gonna go through the arteries first, okay? And so we go through the first two chambers, or the blood goes through the first two chambers, and then it goes to the lungs. And as we take a big deep breath in, we're now filling up that blood with high oxygen levels, okay? So again, pulmonary arteries as it goes away. As it receives that lung, or the oxygen from the lungs, it's now coming back through our pulmonary veins, okay? And it comes back here, right here into this pulmonary vein. It will then go into, excuse me, I said pulmonary vein, my bad. It goes through, this, through the pulmonary vein into this atrium, okay? The left atrium. After it goes into the left atrium, it comes down here to the left ventricle. Now you're gonna see why this heart is oddly shaped or there's a little bit more mass to the bottom here. And you can see the septum. Well, this is thicker, this is a muscle again. So we need the thickest part of this muscle to do the most work. As it leaves our left ventricle, it's gotta get pushed out to the rest of the body. And, and we got hundreds of thousands of uh, of blood vessels that we have to get through, miles of blood vessel. So it's, it's got to pump a long, long way. So we need a strong, strong muscle to be able to push it up and through the aorta and all the way back out, okay? All right, so hopefully you had a sheet something like this you were able to find, um, and you can certainly fill in those, um, these, this diagram using this chart or any other chart that you could find online. Now, let's move over to this part. All right, what am I talk about here in the last thing of the, of the lesson? We're going to talk about collateral circulation. And collateral circulation is an amazing thing. It's keeping a lot of people alive, whether it be your grandparents, my father-in-law, um, is kept alive right now through collateral circulation. Um, so if a person happens to have a heart attack, and we'll get to heart attacks, and there's going to be a few um, um, video links in the comments section below that I want you to watch on, on heart attacks and all the videos, I, I promise you, are less than two minutes, you'll be able to fly right through them. But I want to talk about collateral circulation here for a second. All right, it's the increased amount of blood vessels and blood volume, and it helps prevent death due to heart disease. And, and here's the reason why. Let me grab a marker here. All right. All right, so we know that if, th if this was a blood vessel, over time, as we eat poorly, we build a plaque in, in, our, in our arteries, this can occur. And so what we just simply call as a blockage, okay? And blood is having a harder time to go through the more condensed it is. The more we eat poorly, the more plaque builds up, all right? And eventually this plaque can build all the way up and we can end up having a heart attack. All right, so heart attacks here, let's talk about that real fast here. So if, if I had a, a garden hose 
and I was trying to, to stretch it to try to reach flowers way over there, and I couldn't reach it because I didn't have enough pressure buildup. Oftentimes, a lot of you guys would just take your thumbs, put it over the hose, you build up the pressure inside, and now that water would shoot a further distance, okay? So sometimes pressure is a good thing, but if we had a nozzle on this hose, okay, and the, the, we left the water on, we, we, we dropped the hose, we forgot about it for a, a couple of days or a week, and, and we didn't let water go out, the, the nozzle was closed, eventually it built up so much pressure in the hose, the pressure of the hose would cause a hole in the hose. Well, that's the same would hold true here when we're talking about heart disease. Well, so let me come right through here and let's make this blood vessel a little bit longer. So let's say we have a hole right here, okay? Well, we got things in our blood called platelets and platelets will rush to the aid of any time we get a cut. Whether we get a cut on the outside of our skin, platelets are gonna rush to it and it clots it, and that's a great thing, but it's not a great thing when it's on the walls of our arteries. So if we would happen to have a, a clot, let me grab a different color marker. All right, so let's say platelets that are in our blood, we have, we have hundreds of thousands of platelets, so roughly about 200,000 platelets per milliliter of blood, and these platelets would come right to the aid of that, that, um, that, that rupture, okay, so to speak. But just like any scab, any scab can flake off, all right? Well, we don't want that when it comes to the interior walls of, of our, our blood vessels, because now if we have a blockage here, and let's say this person has 80% to 90% blockage, well, this clot might be very large. When it gets free, like we said before, like a scab gets free, it could come right here and clog. And now we have a heart attack. Okay? We don't want that. So what we can do to help prevent this is we can build up our collateral circulation. All right? Well, how do we do this? You're gonna take your age, all right? You take the number 220. Any, everybody takes the number 220 and everybody's gonna subtract your own age, whether you're 14 or 15 or whatever the case is. So let's just say for argument's sake, you're gonna subtract your age. Let's say you are 15 years of age, okay? We subtract 15 from 220, we get 205. When we exercise, we love to always exercise at least at 60%, okay? 60% of what we're lifting. If, if you're a person that could bench um, 200 pounds, 60% of that would be 120. You're gonna get some types of gains from this. And the same would hold true when we're talking about your circulatory system, all right? So here we go. You're gonna take that number and you're gonna multiply it by, multiply, not addition, multiply it by 0 0.60. If I'm doing my math right, you're going to come out to about 120 beats per minute. All right? This is what we call our target heart rate. Okay? This is our maximum. Now, your maximum isn't here. Your maximum, because you're 15 years of age, would be here. You're sitting about 205 beats per minute. Anything that would exceed that becomes extremely dangerous. So what we need to do is we need to be able to work out at least 20 minutes a day, at least three times per week, if we do those two things, 20 minutes a day, three times a week, above your target heart rate, you are going to develop something we call collateral circulation. Well, again, you guys, what, what, what's that, Mr. Coe? What's collateral circulation? It's this. Let me erase this heart attack here. Let's draw this one more time. All right, there's your blood vessel. Let's say you have a little bit of blockage. 
All right? What, if you are exercising at that, okay, and so it's going to be different for all age groups. Your parents will be lower than this. Your, great, your grandparents will be much lower than this. We just want them to exceed the target heart rate for 20 minutes. So if they do, they're going to have blood vessels that will start to branch off. Okay, and they form other alternative routes. So if I have a, a blockage right here, I might develop enough blood vessels and other ways I can get around a blockage. It's like a traffic jam on I-75 or I-71. You find a different way to get home. Well, this blood is going to find a different way to get around and through this blockage. All right? So it might hit a wall here, but now it can find alternative pathways that can keep somebody alive. Okay? It's not the ideal thing that we want, but it is a possibility that that will, that will save many of your lives. So here is an example of collateral circulation, okay, person A doesn't um, have any blockage, the artery is working just fine, person B, there's partial blockage and they have partial collateral circulation keeping them alive, or person C has tons of blockage, they may have ate horrible or had really bad heredity that, that's causing this, but they're exercising all right, they're constantly walking. They're constantly building up that target heart rate, and they have pretty good collateral circulation, and that is allowing them to get around. Um, there's a famous basketball player named Pistol Pete Maravich, all-time leading scorer in the NCAA history. When he died, they found out that the only reason why he was living was because of collateral circulation, and this is a guy that played against the best players in the world, um, and he was missing one of the carotid arteries in, in his body, but the other carotid artery was so engrossed, so large, um, that he was able to play, and he was one of the best players ever to play this game, and um, he ended up dying in a pickup game after he retired, and he was playing a half-court pickup game, not even hardly jogging, and he has a heart attack, uh, because as you can gain your collateral circulation, you can also lose your collateral circulation. Think of this, if you were, exercising in the weight room and you lifted and lifted and lifted and lifted and then you stop lifting for several months that muscle would deteriorate right it would get smaller well same holds true with your with your blood vessels you can gain them you can also lose them um, that's it in a nutshell i hope to keep that under 10 minutes and please watch a couple other videos uh, besides pistol pete which is about two minutes um Two minutes right there, a minute and 34 seconds. I'd love for you to watch that video about him. Uh, I'd love for you to watch this from the, Cle the Cleveland Clinic about the difference between a heart attack and cardiac arrest. And then Dr. Stork um, is going to talk about signs and symptoms of heart attack. And again, a minute 16, a minute seven, and a minute 34. Um, so that's, that's the lesson in a nutshell. I hope that this is gonna work out and uh, we'll try to keep all of our lessons like this. And I hope you guys have a great day. See you guys soon.